So thank you, Dr. Saptarshi. Thank you, Dr. Kalra and Endocrine Society for inviting me uh, to discuss this uh, pretty important and clinically relevant topic. The caveats in the interpretation of HVOC, we know that HVOC we are frequently using. And this is among the most commonly and most frequently used tool in diabetic uh, treatment portfolio. So the agenda of the today's presentation will be a few historical aspects. We will be discussing then the mechanism of glycation, then few methods about the HVLC measurement. Then uh, the caveats or the various uh, condition where the HVLC might be falsely low or falsely high. What are the alternatives available? If we have uh, these suspicions or doubts that uh, the HVLC might not be the correct, then what to do? We are uh, or the other options what to select. And finally, to conclude. So uh, way back in 1968, few researchers were able to find the association between the HVA1C and the diabetes way back like uh, 1968. And later on is in late 70s or 80, there were further uh, increment in the knowledge of gradation structure and formation of HVA1C was further characterized. Few more studies were published in late 80s and early 90s, but until the DCCT was published, the HV1C was not able to make its ground in the diabetes management. And after the DCCT publication results of the, uh, the DCCT, that was actually established as a main uh, uh, investigating tools to, in the treatment of diabetes mellitus. So HV1C estimation is uh, now we know that this is a most widely used method to assess glycemic memory and decision making as well. Uh, and uh, not only by the ADA, but by WHO also, this is endorsed and by other uh, leading organizations, this is being endorsed for the diagnosis of diabetes and by ADA for the pre-diabetes also, although WHO doesn't recommend to, uh, to diagnose pre-diabetes by the HbA1c. HbA1c was proposed for diagnosing dysglycemia uh, because there was various problems with the OGTT, which was previously used and now also we are using it. But there are some limitations with the two hours OGTT like requirement of an overnight fasting. There were some inconveniences, expenses were more. Inter-individual variations were there, differences in the glucose absorption were there and poor reproducibility. So these all factors actually help HVOC to establish itself as a major tool. As we know that HP1C has uh, several advantages over the OZTT, like convenience, like decreased day-to-day -day variations, greater pre-analytic stability, and the global standardization, like NGSP standards, all of us are aware about that. But when HP1C is frequently used as an initial screening test, there are few risks of either overestimation or underestimation of the severity of glycemia. And that is actually going to profoundly impact the decision making or the counseling of the patient. Either you are suffering from diabetes, either you are not suffering from diabetes, either you are in the pre-diabetic state and you should change your lifestyle or dietary schedules or treatment or whatever. So heavily we are relying on the HP1C, but should be rely on like that. So if we have the ability to recognize the potential for the limitations or the discordance which are inherent with the HP1C that will be really good to our to the health care providers like we people uh, to start with the how the glycation or the how the glycated hemoglobin is formed just a little information that we know that hemoglobin is a tetramer formed of two alpha and two beta globin chains and on a continuous exposure to high level of blood glucose level hemoglobin is actually non enzymatically as well the irreversibility glycation is there at the amino terminal of the beta globin chain. And that is, there is a continuous formation in proportion to the available glucose levels. So the HV1C is a portion of glycated hemoglobin, which is formed by the interaction of glucose and the amino terminal, as I just mentioned, of the beta chain in a multi-step condensation reactions with the, with the hemoglobin. So the whatever glycated hemoglobin which include HbA1c also is actually the function of erythrocyte lifespan. So whatever lifespan of erythrocyte is there, the, the label is actually dependent on that. And the glucose level also. So this basically depends 
so mainly or solely on two factors the glucose level as well the erythrocyte life span so the life span of rbc is told to be nearly 117 days in men while 106 days in women but mean is this is the the total life of rbc but the mean age of circulating rbcs are little different and in diabetic patient that is ranging from 39 to 56 days while in non diabetic this, this is ranging from 38 to 60 days and this variation is large enough to cause the clinically significant differences in hba1c for any glucose level so the inter patient variation larvis life span is there that can explain the differences or variations in the hba1c and that is independent of the glucose level so even independent on the glucose level there might be some variations in the hba1c so this is the inherent problem with hba1c so uh, the hba1c is actually a index of level of glycemic control we know of uh, like last two to three months and out of those three months the the immediate 30 days or immediate last one month is contributing nearly 50% contribution to the hba1c so is this really gold standard as we are following or as we are uh, using but uh, the the different studies has shown little differences in the opinion so many studies not only the cross sectional data but uh, the longitudinal data has also demonstrated that there are some differences uh, in the measurement of diabetic pop uh, population or the progression of individual from pre diabetes to diabetes uh, if we are comparing those uh, based on hba1c or on the fasting plasma glucose or the ogtt criteria there are some studies which has shown that there are differences in the hba1c sensitivity depending upon the ethnicity also and these differences in the sensitivity are very very varying according to the different ethnicity like chinese or the asian indian or africans are having higher level than the caucasians the prevalence of diabetes or prevalence of pre diabetes but like uh, intermediate hyperglycemia the hba1c range 5.7 to 6.4 was significantly less than the ogtt level in a survey done by the enhance like a national health and nutritional examination survey twice uh, between 2005 to 10 and then 11 to 14 they did it twice and they found that there was a significant difference uh, in the prevalence of pre diabetes if you are evaluating it by ogtt or if you are evaluating by the hba1c and the difference was nearly twice so the glucose criteria diagnosed nearly twice more pay, uh, uh, individuals as diabetic then the hba1c criteria so that was the finding of the national health and nutritional examination survey and they also suggested that the sensitivity of hba1c for diagnosing diabetes was quite poor nearly 40% sensitivity was there although the specificity was nearly 100% similarly the glucose criteria particularly the 2r Poor post uh, 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 plasma glucose to our uh, post meal glucose level in the OCTT, uh, they demonstrated greater sensitivity than the HP1C. So the sensitivity was better with the OCTT, while the specificity was uh, good in both of the methods like OCTT and HP1C. In another survey which was done in the Dutch population. Uh, uh the uh, the population was uh, nearly 2 3000 uh, person were included in this study and they this study was done in netherland of uh, between the 2006 to 7 and uh, the age was 42 to uh, 65 year and uh, they found that the sensitivity of a1c was quite low and uh, that missed nearly 76% of the affected individuals so the specificity was fine nearly Uh, 80% 90% or even more than 90% or nearly 99% but the sensitivity was less that we have seen in trials or few uh, data and in this particular study uh, the roc curve you can see here that uh, that was uh, showing sensitivity and specificity that was different at different hb1c level and you can see here that the sensitivity at the hb1c level of 7 was only nearly 24% while the specificity was nearly 100% so the sensitivity was an issue with it coming to the methods uh, to measure the hb1c in the today's era we have various uh, methods available with us uh, to measure uh, hb1c the most wide, widely accepted and most widely used method is the hplc method and uh, uh, whatever method i have uh, uh, mentioned here they are actually ngsp certified methods uh, 
uh, but the other methods except the HPLC are the enzymatic methods, boronate affinity methods, agar gel, electrophoresis method, immunoassay methods, or capillary electrophoresis methods. So there are various uh, methods available. And uh, there are uh, some point of care strips or uh, some uh, small instruments also available. I'm sure that all of you have uh, or seen or using in your day-to-day uh, -day clinic also, although that is not NGST certified. Uh, there is an equation which has given to interchange the NGSP uh, percentage HP1C level and the IFCC level, which is shown in millimole per mole, and this formula is shown here. And whatever method you are using, the uh, method principle is actually to either they are actually trying to separate the glycated from the non glycated hemoglobin, or they are trying to separate HP1C specifically from the other hemoglobins. And this can be done. Uh, based on the method used and the uh, they actually uh, use the the charge differences in the charge or differences in the structures and based on that they try to differentiate it but as we uh, we are using like a gold standard so uh, is this really a gold standard but there are various situations where the false low label might be there false high level might be there and what are those conditions we will be discussing in coming few slides so first discussing those conditions which can lead to the falsely low HP1C level. The, the commonest and the most important are the hematological condition. And in those conditions where the loss of erythrocytosis is there or erythrocytes is there, like, like hemolysis or hemolytic anemia, that ultimately lead to the rapid turnover of the RBCs. Chronic malaria cases, which are not uncommon in Indian setup. Acute blood loss because of any reasons. Hyperspleenism, again, there is more destruction of RBCs. Cirrhosis of liver, various hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell anemia or sickle cell tract, myelodysplastic syndromes. These all are the situations where falsely low HP1C will be there. Few other hematological treatment, like uh, at, when you are treating with iron or with, with vitamin B12, like uh, uh, administration of these medications, erythropoietin therapy, recent blood transfusion, these all again can lead to the low HP1C level. Pregnancy is very specific situation where we know that uh, that is a different uh, physiological state where there is altered RBC kinetics, there is increased erythropoiesis, and there is hemodilution. So these all factors are actually operating and particularly in the latter half of the second trimester, the HP1C might not be reliable and HP1C might be underestimating the actual glycemic status. So depending upon these factors, HP1C is actually not uh, recommended as a tool for diagnosis, diagnosing uh, the gestational diabetes mellitus. Although if somebody is already diabetic and she is being monitored on HP1C, you can use, but you should also rely on the other method like SMBG or if you are willing to screen for uh, gestational diabetes, then you should use the positivity. Two other condition which can lead to the false low. So the number of conditions are many, like vitamin E ingestion that can lead to the decreased glycation which is commonly used to treat the NAFLD situation. Interferon alpha therapy or rivavirin, dapson, antiretroviral therapy, particularly the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And here, OGTT or fructosamine are better. Cotrimoxazole, hydroxyurea, low doses of aspirin, antipsychotic medication, not all but few. Corticosteroid therapy, these all can lead to the falsely low. Coming to the falsely high uh, a level of HVNC in which conditions that is there. So in situation where anemia is there with the decreased RBC turnover, like iron deficiency anemia, that can lead to the falsely high level. Vitamin B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, splenectomy condition or asplenia cases, racial differences, orogenicity differences as we have just discussed. So this is being noted that nearly 0.4% uh, differences might be there uh, in the white population. So in the Caucasians, that is less in comparison to the blacks or other uh, uh, ethnicity people. The statin therapy, we know that the statin has the labirogenic potential, but on the top of that, if you are taking statin in higher doses for prolonged duration, that can again lead to the falsely elevated HP1C level, uh, irrespective of the labirogenic potential. Aging again can lead to the higher HP1C level, approximately 0.01 percent increment per year. More condition of falsely high HP1C. 
like severe hypertriglyceridemia, particularly if the triglyceride level is more than 1700. That is not uncommon in our OPD scenario. Higher bilirubinemia cases, if you are looking at those cases where the bilirubin is more than 20. Alcoholism, if it's, is it, it is chronic. So if, if a chronic alcoholic you are seeing, don't rely on HP1C because there is formation of acetaldehyde HP1C. Similarly, in uremia, in those cases also there is formation of carbamylated hemoglobin and that might be misleading and that can lead to the high HP1C level. Chronic salicylate ingestions that can interfere with the SC, so false lower false side. Chronic opioid ingestion or lead poisoning, although the mechanism is not clear, but they can also lead to the false high level. There are a few more conditions where variable results, sometimes low, sometimes high might be there, like fetal hemoglobin, math hemoglobin, hemoglobinopathies, particularly thalassemias, particularly the homozygous variants. To the heterozygous variants, most of the NGSP certified labs are okay, means they are reliable, but for the homozygous, they, there might be some problems. Red blood cell cell transfusion, if it is, it is too much, like multiple units are given, then because of the dilutional effect, it can uh, lead to the false low. While if the storage was done in the glucose-rich uh, medium, uh, then that can lead to the false high levels. Vitamin C can lead to false high or false low level, depending upon the method used. So if you are using by uh, method chromatography method, then this is false low. If you are using electrophoresis, then that can lead to the false high levels. There is one more important concept that is known as glycation gap. And what is that? So there are evidences that has shown that there are inter-individual variations in the HP1C level. So, so whatever the level of uh, means gl glucose level, so uh, the HP1C level might not be constant among the individuals who are having the similar bl blood glucose level or similar fructosamine level. So if you are having similar blood glucose level, the HP1C level might be different in the different individuals. And this is known as the glycation gap. So the glycation gap actually defines the difference, differences between the glycated hemoglobin level and the blood glucose data or the fluct, uh, fructosamine level. And there is one more entity which is known as hemoglobin, hemoglobin glycation index and that define the differences between HP1C and the predicted HP1C, which you are going to calculate with the available mean blood glucose level like the CGMS data or other. So uh, there, there are uh, uh, there is glycation gap and there are low glycators, there are high glycators, so there might be differences in the glycation rate of the hemoglobin. If there are high glycators, the HP1C level might be high, if there are low glycators, the HP1C level might be low, and that can lead to the wrong decision makings. If you are uh, treating high glycators, you are presuming that the HP1C is high, and you are over treating and leading to the hypoglycemias, while on the low glycator, you are presuming that control is okay, and the patient is actually not having the, uh, the good glycemic control. And in the clinical pictures also, I'm sure that all of we are facing this, that sometimes the, the glucose level or routine, the, the chart, the patient are uh, intelligent enough and they are maintaining the chart, but the HP1C is not uh, resembling or uh, they are not reflecting the levels. So these are those situations. There are a few studies, uh, particularly in type 1 patient, which has shown the genetic contribution to the A1C also, and that can lead to the heritability of glycation. So the glycation gap might be heritable also. There are a few reports. On the top of these all problems, there are a few other issues with HB1C. Like during today's time or COVID era, a lot of patients are on steroid therapy, the blood glucose level are 400, 500 or whatever, but the HB1C might remain normal. So that can lead to the, the problems in the decision making if you are totally relying solely on the HB1C, that might be pro problematic. During perioperative periods also, the HB1C might be still high, although the blood glucose has come down normal. Uh, but still, if you're relying on HB1C, the decision making regarding the patient should be, should be taken for surgery or not, that might be um, problematic. The relevance of borderline HB1C, we have seen that they are, they are controversial in various NNs data also we have seen. And sensitivity issues already we have discussed. Standardization is definitely one issue, particularly in country like ours. The standardization is always a problem. According to the NGSP standards, uh, they actually provide certification only for a year. And on uh, next year, you, you should again get certified depending upon the 
the lot of the the uh, the toolkits, uh, the instruments, the the calibration uh, method, whatever you are using. So for everything, you need to be calibrated. You you should be uh, you should again have the standardization, but that is not uh, frequently done in our country. Even in the Western world, the standardization might be difficult. Lack of availability of reliable or uniform diagnostic uh, test. As we have discussed, that there are various methods, and probably there might be some difference. The cost is definitely high. And in most of the uh, laboratories, uh, in comparison to the routine blood glucose analysis and ethnicity uh, or races difference, uh, differences we have already discussed. One more issue, like uh, the pathophysiology is actually not being reflected with the HP1C. We know that in the initial uh, pre-diabetic state, uh, the beta cell dysfunction is, uh, is has started and HP1C is insensitive uh, for identifying these individuals, these works where the HP1C is less than 5.7. And uh, uh, notably, the individual with impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose, there is a marked decline in beta cell function, we know, but HP1C does not, doesn't does recognize them. So OGTT is preferred for identifying individuals with early beta cell dysfunction who are at a risk of future development of diabetes. And that we have seen that in the, the National Health and Nutritional Survey examination, we have seen that uh, the OGTT was better in detecting those cases. So. These all issues are there, but in addition, there are a few more problems like HB1C can't recognize the hypoglycemias. HB1C can't recognize the glycemic variabilities, inter or intraday glycemic excursions. HB1C has problems like uh, we have discussed I mean, hemoglobinopathies, pregnancies, anemia, medications. The, the recent uh, concept of time in range that again cannot be diagnosed with the HB1C. So there are various issues with HPLC, what we have discussed. So if we have so many issues, what are the other options? If we have discordance, so alternatives are available, although they have their own limitations, but there are alternatives available. Like CGMS, everybody of us are using it. Fructosamine assay that is available in India also with the lal pet lab. Uh, sometime we are ordering it, although not very frequently. Glycated albumin, 1,5-anhydroglucetol, available with Quest. OGTT, that is excellent for screening. So the main characteristic of the alternative indices which are available uh, for glycemic control as we have just discussed, fructosamine assay, glycated albumin, 1,5-anhydroglucetol, CGMS. So the, uh, the time frame of reflective average glycemia of fructosamine and glycated albumin is nearly two to three weeks because they are based upon the non-enzymatic uh, measurement of the glycation of albumin, serum albumin, the first two methods. So we know that the half-life of albumin is nearly 14 days. So they are showing uh, the reflection of glycemic memory for last two to three weeks. 1,5-N-hydroglucetol, again, up to two weeks. But the mechanism is different here. There is a competition between the glucose and the 1,5-N-hydroglucetol at the renal level, at the renal reabsorption level. And there is competitive inhibition. So if you have poor glycemia, the 1,5-N-hydroglucetol is low or vice versa. Uh, well, CGMS, everybody is already aware. The condition where this is most useful. So if you want to assess a recent change, in the glycemic status, then fructosamine assay or end stage uh, kidney disease also, they are really useful. But in end stage kidney disease, 15 5 nidoglucetol is not useful because uh, that there, there is the mechanism is related with the renal reabsorption. While for evaluation of uh, glycemic variability, CGMS is best, no doubt about that. But there are situations where even these alternative methods have their limitation, they might not be correct, like condition of hypoproteinemia, like cirrhosis, like nephrotic syndrome, like other few conditions that, that may lead to the problems with the fructosamine assay or glycated albumin assay. While in the C, uh, CKD patient, you cannot use 1,5-N-I-2-glucetol, while CGMS might have some interference, uh, they have the delay in the interstitium and that has uh, some lag potential as well uh, the acetaminophen or ascorbic acid might have some interferences. Finally, to the conclusion, uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, one size doesn't fit for all. And we should uh, be aware that uh, uh, there are various limitations with HP1C, standardization has problems, and uh, particularly the sensitivity is not that good and that has been 
proven in various uh, cross-sectional data and longitudinal data. And uh, in, in terms of sensitivity, that is not good. But although this specificity is excellent, particularly for the pre-diabetic cases, uh, the utility of HP1C is, uh, is uh, uh, not, not that good. Here, OGTD is better. As we have discussed that the pathology, uh, pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus, that, has, uh, uh, that doesn't recognize that. Hypoglycemic episode, again, doesn't recognize. Glycemic variability cannot be assessed. Time in range concept cannot be accessed. And uh, there are various hematological issues, hydrogenic issues, chronic disease. We have discussed genetic, racial, pregnancy, aging, glycation gap, technical problems, laboratory problems. These all can lead to the false estimation and false decision making of the treatment. You might be over treating, you might be under treating. So you should be aware, you should be vigilant enough about those all limitation and problem. And whenever you have any suspicion or whenever you have any discordant between the, the SMBG label or the CGMS label or the, the symptomatology of the patient uh, in, in, in a nutshell overall uh, presentation, then alternative options are there and you can use them. And if you are aware, then definitely you are going to provide better patient care. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, ASL.